Chair, please um, give us your doctrine order lecture. Chief Ed Chung. Thank you, Marge. Thanks for the introduction. <laughs> so, completely different talk. Um, so, I'm a uh, clinical lecturer here and um, a registrar uh, working at the Leicester General Hospital and delighted uh, and thank you to the university uh, for giving me the opportunity to give this talk today. So my talk is uh, on uh, my PhD findings. Uh, I'll just go through it. So just to describe the work that we do in our lab. So we work on IJ nephropathy, um, which is the commonest uh, primary disease of the filters of the kidneys uh, worldwide, the glomeruli. Um, it tends to affect younger people, it tends to affect people in their second and third decades of life, but can affect people of any age group. Um, and estimated instance is, is somewhere between one to two uh, people uh, per 100,000 population uh, per year in the UK, which probably equates to around 500 to 1,000 people uh, being diagnosed with this condition every year. Um, around a third of uh, patients develop progressive uh, kidney damage um, leading to uh, kidney failure, necessitating the need for treatments such as dialysis and transplantation, which uh, themselves are associated with um, uh, much higher rates of morbidity uh, and mortality compared to the general population. So an important disease uh, to study. And specifically, there's no um, disease-specific uh, treatment available for this condition. So we treat this disease clinically <coughs> as we would many other kind of uh, diseases of the filters of the kidneys. And really, what, it's characterised by some subtle but important changes uh, to the IgA immune system. And these are some biopsy pictures of what uh, IgA nephropathy looks like uh, um, uh, if you take a kidney biopsy and look down the microscope. And just to highlight that it's a disease that affects people around the world, um, so these are percentages of people with IgA nephropathy compared to total kidney biopsies, about 25% uh, in Europe. Uh, but it is a very common disease in Asia, uh, reaching 40 to 50% of, of total biopsies. And interestingly, quite rare in Africa, only about 1% of total biopsies. Uh, some of this will be differences in uh, the way that the, the, the diseases, are, diseases are screened for uh, and, um, um, and, um, uh, and diagnosed. Uh, but a lot of this will be due to genetic risk factors as well. So some uh, uh, renal physiology uh, uh, for this time in the evening. So uh, introduction to the kidneys. Um, so the kidneys provide a lot of uh, uh, vital uh, functions uh, for life. Uh, so balance of salt and water and excretion of excess water. Uh, getting rid of excess of waste products uh, provides a function in secreting uh, endocrine function in secreting activated vitamin D, which is vital for bone health and erythropoietin as well for, for, for maintenance of blood cells and control of blood pressure. And just to zoom in more, so the kidneys are amazing organs, and I'm not just saying that because I'm specialising in kidneys. Um, so they process a litre of blood every minute. 180 litres are filtered through the kidneys um, uh, per day uh, through this filtering apparatus. And about 99% of that is reabsorbed in this part called the proximal tubule. And so this is the functioning part of the kidney called the nephron, and we have one million of nephrons uh, per kidney. And the disease that we, we study at the lab is focused on this tiny bit called the glomerulus up here, and that's a specialised kind of tuft of capillaries where all this filtration takes place. And just to zoom into that further, so this is the tuft of capillaries with an afferent uh, supplying arterial and then exiting arterial and the blood goes through here and it's filtered through here. So, uh, so, so you get the filtrate coming through here into the proximal tubule, so the tubule that drains that filter. Um, and this is a, a, a nice electron microscopy picture showing these uh, little filters and their blood supply. Uh, and if you imagine if we took a slice through here, if we did a kidney biopsy, this is the kind of section that we might discuss in one of our biopsy meetings where we can think about and diagnose uh, disorders of these filters. And so IgA nephropathy is a disease of these filters where the antibody uh, 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 sticks onto these filters, clogs up, and then causes kidney damage. And so what is IgA? IgA is a type of antibody, 
and it's part of your normal immune system. And we all have a lot of IgA in our blood, in our lungs, and in our gut, so especially in the mucosal areas where IgA fights off infections. Um, but what happens in IgA nephropathy is that there's subtle differences to that IgA, the antibody molecule that makes it sticky and stick down and cause damage. And so we now know, uh, through a lot of research that's been done, and initially in Leicester, actually, in our laboratories here, uh, but these findings have been replicated um, uh, throughout the world now, that there's differences in this molecule. Um, so we know uh, by isolating that, those IgA deposits and looking them at them in the, labo the laboratory, uh, we know that the IgA is specifically of this IgA1 isotype, and that, that has an extended hinge region, um, and that uh, in IgA nephropathy, um, that, that IgA1 in the hinge region lacks sugar residues called galactose residues, uh, so that the IgA is termed as being poorly galactosylated. And that IgA is thought to be path particularly pathogenic or disease causing. And because it ha lacks those sugar residues, it makes it clump together um, uh, into polymers, so it's polymeric, and attached to other antibodies and makes it more prone to clogging up the filters in the kidneys. So there's now a, 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 a <coughs> hypothesis, a multi-hit hypothesis, where this poorly galactosylated IgA, uh, which is disease causing, and then uh, there's production of antibodies against this that leads to circulating immune complexes that then deposit in the kidneys, causing damage uh, to those filters. But one of the main questions we have in IgA nephropathy is why do people who have equivalent amounts of IgA stuck onto their kidneys have very different outcomes? As I mentioned at the start, about 30% of people uh, progress uh, to kidney failure requiring treatments like dialysis. Whereas other people can have similar amounts of IgA on their kidneys, but never come to clinical attention and never know they have IgA nephropathy in the first place. We know one of the main risk factors in IgA nephropathy is the development of protein in the urine, which makes it go frothy, like here. And when you take a biopsy, whether they're scarring the, in the actual tissue of the kidney, which is called the interstitium. So how does IgA in the, in the glomerulus cause scarring further down the line? Well, most focus has been on depositing of IgA production of mediators or cytokines that can drive uh, damage, filtration through of these cytokines, and then their actions on the proximal tubular cells. But we were interested in the direct effect of this damaging IgA and whether it could have a direct effect on the proximal tubule. And this just wasn't known before. So our hypothesis was if the IgA could have a specific effect on the filters, could it have a specific effect downstream and drive this scarring? And we knew from observational studies uh, that the levels of IgA and IgA nephropathy in the urine are increased. And also that IgA binds to the cells that line these tubules um, in cell culture. So the main questions for my thesis were, does IgA cross the filtration barrier? Uh, does the kidney handle IgA differently when that filtration barrier is damaged or when those tubular cells are damaged? And lastly, can IgA interact with those cells to promote kidney scarring? So to answer the first two questions, uh, we chose to look at this by multi-photon uh, microscopy. So a lot of that data came from cell culture experiments, but we really wanted to see whether this happened uh, in, in real life, in, in, in living systems. Um, so I was very lucky to get funding to go across to Indiana University in the US uh, to spend a month there. It was very cold when I was there, it was minus 20 degrees, uh, but spent a lot of time in the laboratory uh, looking at this uh, using their systems. Uh, so multi-photon microscopy uh, is interesting. It was first described actually by a German um, uh, theoretical uh, physicist uh, in the 1930s as part of her PhD uh, thesis. And she later went on to win the Nobel Prize uh, for some of her later work called Maria Gopert. And she described this uh, concept that if you hit a, a molecule with two photons simultaneously, 
then it can cause excitation of that atom into an excited state. So this was a theory, and 30 years later it was proved with the invention of uh, lasers and pulsatile lasers, and it's now being exploited today. So, that it, so by using multi-photon microscopy, by using pulsatile lasers, uh, it can carry significant advantages over standard single photon microscopy, which just uses one laser, because if you can hit it with two lasers at the same time, you can use longer wavelengths, which carry less energy, and therefore cause less, uh, less damage to surrounding structures and less out-of-focus uh, uh, light scattering, which allows us to image further into tissue, as you can see here, the difference between multi-photon or single-photon uh, microscopy. So the main advantage of multi-photon microscopy is that it allows us to see what's happening in living tissues uh, as opposed to kind of fixed tissues. And the kidney is particularly amenable to this uh, because the kidneys are situated quite close to the surface. And we can look at this and look at blood flow through the kidneys and look at how it handles different proteins. So here's some beautiful pictures of the group I was collaborating with. So you can see now um, these were taken from live images uh, of, a, of a capillary, uh, of a glomerula, sorry. These are the tubules that line it. This is some work done on podocytes and how the, uh, some cells that are integral to this filtration barrier, how these react uh, to injury to the kidney. And here I'll show you a, a real-time video uh, from our collaborators in Indiana. <coughs> And I'll play it shortly, and I'll just describe what's happening. Okay, so the red, um, so here's the glomerulus here, the, the, the tuft of capillaries. And they've labelled uh, a, a protein called albumin uh, with a dye, uh, a red dye uh, called Texas red. Um, and you'll see it floating around this uh, capillary. Uh, this is done in a rat. Um, and you can see that the albumin will filter through this um, uh, uh, glomerulus and start accumulating here in the tubules, if I play the video on. Oh, sorry, I've gone past it. And if you saw those black uh, 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 discs whizzing through, uh, those are blood uh, cells coming through as well. So to answer our questions, we looked at three groups uh, in this lab in Indiana. We looked at wild type uh, rats. We looked at uh, rats that express the human uh, diphtheria toxin receptor on podocytes um, uh, to answer the question, uh, how does um, uh, the kidney handle IgA if that glomerular filtration barrier is damaged? And we induced tubular uh, damage uh, by a model where we induced ischemia reperfusion injury uh, followed by uh, contralateral nephrectomy. Uh, and that damages the tubule cells that, lot, uh, that drain the, the filters. We injected with labelled IgA, and then we imaged uh, following injection. And these are some histology slides. Um, the normal kidneys at the top, um, when we damaged the podocytes by uh, the glomerular filtration uh, barrier damage, uh, you can see subtle changes here in the filters. And here, um, our chronic kidney disease uh, tubular model uh, looking very much like human uh, kind of end-stage kidney with lots of collagen and, and scar tissue uh, being deposited in the, in the substance of the, the kidney highlighted in blue. Uh, and this was our characteristics just to say that the tubular injury model led to more protein excretion in the urine and worse kidney function as we expected. So this was the first run, and, and we, were, uh, um, we were quite surprised uh, and interested to see in the wild types that we could still see Ig depositing here in the glomerulus. So this is the glomerulus here. This is the tubule that drains it, and you can see the tubules all, all coming through here. <coughs> There's some the, the distal tubules here that don't autofluoresce. Uh, and you could see these red dots, the IgA, depositing here on the mesangium and then uh, coming through here into the first part of the tubule and actually interacting with these uh, tubular cells. Uh, so this was the first time in vivo uh, that we were able to see an interaction uh, between IgA and the proximal tubule. And you can see the level of detail that we can get uh, uh, from this uh, technology. Um, 
and you can see this red IGA uh, just being deposited here in those mesangial spaces. It was, this wasn't a focus for a study uh, looking at the glomeruli, uh, but certainly we could see deposition occur from about four to six hours onwards. And what we observed was that when the IGA filtered through, it was absorbed um, through the apical surfaces, so, so, so the cells that line uh, the lumen of the tubules here. And you could see that quite nicely lining and then by 90 minutes traveling across uh, to the other side of the membrane, uh, which was quite pleasing to see because uh, when I went to the US, the, uh, uh, the primary investigator there said, well, I just think it's coming from the bloodstream that supplies these tubules. Um, and we saw through our injury uh, models that when you disrupt this filtration barrier, uh, that the proximal tubules have a capacity uh, to take up increased amounts of IgA, as we see here. But actually, if you damage the tubules, um, that there's hardly any IgA uptake at all. <clears throat> so that's important that IgA uptake requires healthy tubules, um, um, and that this is likely to be an active process. And this is a similar uh, images that have just been zoomed out, uh, and our quantification showed that as well. Uh, and uh, when we did merged images, Jing, looking at lysosomes, we could see that the IgA was taken up and processed in the cells uh, by the, the small organelles, the lysosomes, and properly uh, uh, metabolized that way. The same happened when we separated out the IgA into its monomeric and polymeric forms, uh, that there was IgA uptake in the tubules. So that really answered our first two questions. Uh, can IgA cross the glomerular filtration barrier? Uh, yes, it did, um, even in, 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 uh, with low degrees of proteinuria. And the kidney did handle IgA differently when that filtration barrier was damaged. So lastly, does IJ interact with the tubular cells to promote kidney scarring? So we were able to, we then went back to the laboratory and looked at cell culture experiments, and we showed that IJ was able to upregulate uh, mediators or cytokines that are thought to be very important in promoting inflammation and scarring of the kidney from these tubular cells. So interleukin-6 here, IJ increasing it, and IJ in increasing TGF beta, an important uh, mediator for that process. And when we looked at further, we saw a whole host of different cytokines that are increased with this process. We also looked at intracellular signaling, and we found that IJ was able to upregulate and trigger signaling, uh, important signaling pathways in these cells. So spleen tyrosine kinase, uh, IJ increased uh, phosphorylation of that, and that's important because there's now a clinical trial looking at uh, uh, blocking this pathway um, in IJ nephropathy. And the PPAR response elements, so PPAR intracellular signaling was increased by IGA as well, as shown by this bar. Interestingly, we found a similar response when we isolated IGA from both healthy subjects and from IGA nephropathy patients in increasing TGF beta production from tubular cells. And we weren't sure why that was, but when we looked backwards at the structure of the IGA in these and broke it down by whether it was polymeric or monomeric, we found that the polymers, so the, the clumps of the IGA, um, triggered the TGF beta uh, production more. And also the IGA that was lacking the sugar molecules on it, so if you remember the more disease causing type of IGA, uh, also increased this. Uh, 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 this mediator more as well. So this particular form of IgA that we think is more disease causing had the strongest response from the tubular cells. And this is the form of IgA that's increased in patients with IgA nephropathy and correlates with disease progression. And so what's the receptor for this uh, for, for IgA in the proximal tubular cells? Um, it's not clear. Previous studies uh, have, uh, have, have shown that um, classical receptors such as FC alpha or FC alpha mu are not present on, on, on the, in the proximal tubule, but one candidate is megalin, which is highly expressed in the proximal tubules. It's a multi ligand receptor, um, and we were able to look at a megalin uh, cytoplasmic tail GST, uh, a fusion protein, and show that IgA, when you incubated that with proximal tubular cells, 
cause phosphorylation of part of that receptor, indicating that IgA probably interacts uh, with this receptor, but a lot more work needs to be done in that area. So hopefully I've shown you that as well as this pathway of filtering through cytokines after IgA deposits on the filters and activates the, the tubules, that we've shown a second pathway um, that IgA, after damage to this filtration barrier, is able to escape through and also have a direct effect on the proximal tubule, driving the process of scarring and kidney damage. And our conclusions are that IgA can be filtered across, that it interacts with the, uh, the apical surface of the tubules, uh, the proximal tubules, and that this is increased after uh, uh, damage to the filtration barrier. And this particular form of IgA seems to have a specific effect make, which may contribute uh, to the progression of disease. So we've got a lot more questions to be answered in, uh, in the laboratory. What's the, what exactly is the receptor responsible? Uh, can we block uh, the, that receptor? Uh, can these pathways which are stimulated in the cells, can they be, can they be blocked as well? Are these new therapeutic avenues that we can go down for IgA nephropathy? The, the IgA that lacks the sugar molecules and forms immune complexes, do they differ in IgA nephropathy compared to healthy subjects? And lastly, what we're working on uh, quite uh, closely as well is how does IgA interact with the complicated cascade and how does this promote scarring of the kidneys? So I'll finish there. I'd like to uh, say, uh, acknowledge um, uh, our wonderful IJ Nephropathy Research Group and my supervisors, uh, Dr Molyneux, uh, Prof Barrett, who are in the audience here, Professor Brunskill, and also our collaborators here in Indiana, uh, Ruben Sandoval, uh, Professor uh, Molitoris, and the whole group there for making me feel very welcome. And obviously all the patients who very generously donated blood samples uh, for this study and our funders here the Mayor of Trust, uh, the MRC for my fellowship, uh, and my current funders as well. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic lecture on a completely different subject. So do we have any couple of good questions? You'll be here for some drinks afterwards, presumably. Couple of good questions, anybody? What are the current treatment options for IgA in the use of nephropathy, and how does that kind of change the picture? Yeah, so um, the current treatments are, are really limited to kind of blood pressure lowering treatments and treatments uh, that reduce the amount of protein in the urine. So uh, treatments uh, such as ACE inhibitors uh, or angiotensin receptor blockers. Mm -hmm. Those have the most evidence. The evidence for other forms that, uh, of treatments that suppress the immune system is pretty weak, actually. Um, and there's a danger that some of these more blanket approaches uh, to suppress the immune uh, treatment uh, system, such as steroids, can actually may actually ca cause more harm than good. So there, there's still a lot of trials going on, but in the pipeline, there's a lot more trials coming out to try and uh, target the immune system in, in various ways, really. This work is still in, in, in quite an early stage. If we can work on those receptors and pathways, that might lead to uh, more interesting pathways um, to be developed. Is there any current research looking at interleukin-6 inhibitors in, in that and trying to sort of see if that would help? Or is there nothing else? Specifically like that? Question. Uh, not, to my, uh, not to my knowledge, uh, to be because honest. Because that's yes. upregulated, yep. we could potentially... Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, that's just one of the pathways yeah. that's upregulated, but an important pathway uh, mm -hmm. for sure. Yes, sorry, I, a really enjoyable talk, I have to say, I really enjoyed it, but um, how far are we from identifying the patients that still have these plaques, if you like, yep. um, and having no effect on them, off marathon yep. running, what yep. have you, yep. and those who are in the hospitals, how far are we from identifying the molecular causes of that? Um, uh, that's a yeah, that's a a good question. Um, I think at the start, when you, when when we take a biopsy, we rely on on factors uh, such as t the presence of scarring. Um, but in some some ways, really, the damage is already done by that stage. Um, do you mean uh, from a do you mean from a blood test, or yeah, is that what you mean? Yeah, uh, yes, yeah. So I think we are some distance away. Um, when we look at uh, the increase in IgM, we look at techniques to detect whether those sugar molecules are missing. There's still a big overlap uh, between uh, people um, 
uh, with those sugar molecules missing. Uh, so that's not really a suitable diagnostic test. Um, and because there's multiple hits involved, it's likely uh, that um, it's a combination, actually, of factors uh, that are important. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure you'll, you'll take a few questions over a drink. So can we um, present you with your certificate and um, check at the back, which we can find? Just smile. Good smile. All things over. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>